Rick is going to talk today about things to look for when buying a cargo camper. Hi, I'm Rick. My cargo trailer that we've converted into this camper is the second cargo trailer that I've owned. The first one I had for, I think, about 13 years. A wheel bearing went. I ended up buying the, the trailer that I currently have that we made into the camper. Now, there's a big difference between those two trailers in terms of the the quality. I was much younger. I knew I was going to use it for a number of years, so I went with a, a better built trailer, and it held up quite well. A lot of the talk here with these cargo trailers, everybody is directing you to go to the deluxe model rather than the standard model, and they're saying the standard models are junk. If you're looking at a cargo trailer conversion, you're merely going to use it a recreational vehicle rather than being a full-time. Do you really need the absolute best in a trailer. That's my question. And that's why some of my recommendations tend to go against the public opinion that's out there on buying these ones with all tubular framing components and the heavy duty skin. So in other words, if someone's only using it for the weekends, not going that far, then they may not need to put in all the expense for the top line. Exactly. Right? That's my, my trailer is not a top of the line trailer. And I've used it uh, pretty much every day for work for a number of years. And it's held up. The more expensive trailers, the skin is 30 thousandths of an inch thick. The cheaper trailers, the skin is like 24 thousandths of an inch thick. Now that's six thousandths of an inch difference of thickness. Can you see that difference? Yeah, if you looked at it from the edge, you, you, your eyes are strong enough to be able to determine a difference of six thousandths of an inch. And you'll feel it. And if you're using it uh, relatively consistently, the 24 thousandths skin is probably going to show some rippling, what they call oil canning versus the 30 thousandths, which is a little stiffer. So your 30 thousandths of an inch skin is going to maintain its appearance better and longer than the cheaper skin. Also, they talk about the wall stud spacing. Now, on the super, super deluxe trailers, the walls, the floors, and the roof are all, uh, frame members are all spaced on 16 inch centers. Now, is that necessary? I don't think so. The roofs, particularly, unless you're going to do something heavy duty with them, two foot centers is fine. The walls, 16 inch centers is definitely preferred. The floors can go either way on that. We're going to get a lot of complaints about this. Oh, I have no doubt. The <laughs> All right, but you know, my floor and my trailer is two foot centers with three quarter inch plywood. Um, over time, they tend to kind of get a little wavy after, you know, 10, 15 years. But it's nothing excessive. With 16 inch centers, it's definitely going to make for a much stiffer floor. For the most part, the two foot centers is adequate. Is it going to increase the longevity of the trailer? Maybe, but not by a whole lot. The floors generally rot out from being wet, not from the... Uh, dimensions of the material that they're framed on. Uh, the roof material, you know, I've seen a lot of these trailers now, they're using a one piece roof. My first trailer had a galvanized uh, tin or steel roof on it. And after about 10 years, it started to get pretty rusty looking. So I ended up having to go up there and we wire brushed it and put one of those um, aluminized roof coatings that they used to use on the mobile homes on it in order to extend the life on it. Obviously the seamless one-piece metal roof would be less problematic but it's less likely to leak because it's less, less likely to leak because it's one piece but my trailer that I have now the, the roof appears to be more of a, I, I think it's an actual aluminum roof rather than a steel roof. Um, it is four foot panels, so they're seamed, but they're seamed quite well. And the material that they use to seal it 
is a very uh, heavy duty type of compound and I've had no problem with it whatsoever. There's no sign of it leaking. It's not, uh, it's not showing any mold or mildew, which some of the, the butyl rubber compounds when, that they use to uh, seal some of the trailers did. I think you bring up a good point. So your trailer is less expensive, yet it doesn't mean it's junk. You haven't had issues with it, not going wood. No, I haven't. Okay. Now, somebody, maybe they have, if you've had issues with a cheap trailer, I'm sure you would never recommend them. We haven't had issues. Other items on here is header caps made of fiberglass. All right, my first trailer had a header cap. It was plastic though, not fiberglass, but it held up. My new trailer has a flat roof rather than the arched roof. And so there is no header cap there, the way the construction is done on it. Plywood for floors and interiors. I do believe that um, interior trailers should be plywood rather than the OSB that they're using in a lot of them. Um, they are using this material in the floors now that's more waterproof. It's called dry shield or something floors. Um, I don't have that much experience with it, but I can see that that would probably be desirable if this is something you're looking to keep for 20 years or you're driving it pretty consistently in wet locations. So this is the one you agree with completely? Yeah, I do agree that the 3 8 three -eighth plywood is, is more desirable and 3 quarter plywood floor or the dry shield uh, floor are the way to go. Well, everybody talks about um, the axles and they talk about these Dexter rubber axles being so far superior to leaf springs. My first trailer had the, the Dexter torsion axles on it, and that trailer was horrible on the road. It bounced something awful. The trailer that I have now has leaf springs. It rides far better than my first trailer. Didn't matter whether the first trailer was empty or had a lot of weight on it. It still just launched itself in the air every time you hit a bump. You could be hitting the bump, look in the side view mirror and see those uh, trailer tires come off the ground six. Everybody else is opinionated in exactly opposite of what I am. So the reality of it is, probably unless you own the trailer and you f experience it firsthand, you're not going to be able to 100% foresee or forecast what your experience with the trailer is going to be like. Not everybody needs to own a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes or a Cadillac well, for transportation. And the same is true with the trailers. Not everybody needs to own the most expensive. Um, dual or single axles? Um, most people that I talk to that have a trailer, uh, whether it's a camper or a cargo, they prefer the dual axle because they're leery of having a blowout on the trailer with a single axle that you could lose control and, and lose the trailer. And there's probably an element of truth to that. Now, one of the bad things with the trailer is because it's basically a separate vehicle, you can't always feel or hear when there's a problem with that trailer. And so you could have like, for instance, a bearing going on the trailer it could be squeaking and unless you happen to have had your window down when you were pulling out with it and notice that you might not catch it out on the highway. The same with even they start losing a little bit of air and the tire, tire going flat. The trailer start to lean, but you may not be aware of it until it's too late, until that tire shredded off the rim and, and now you're in a situation that's actually dangerous. So almost all the short trailers have a single axle. There's nothing wrong with it. If you got a bigger trailer, obviously, Air on the side of caution, you go carrying more weight, you go with a double axle. That's that's my opinion there. They spring assist rear door ramps. They say this is a, a necessity. Do they actually have make these without the spring assist? Yeah. They do. Smaller trailers with ramp doors, a lot of them don't have any kind of assist on them. But. Okay. So this says that for your safety, spring assist is the mechanism that makes operating and closing the ramp floor door of your trailer easier and safer. 
So I read some articles that said it's it's a must. Um, how how do you use that back door? Uh, well, again, it depends on the size of the trailer. If you got a six foot wide with a ramp door, one person could probably handle it without it being spring assist. You get into a seven or an eight or eight and a half foot wide trailer ramp door, if it doesn't have spring assist, you're going to take two or three people to open and close it. Yeah. And we don't we don't have that kind of door, so. Right. Um, number eight says, look at the warning. Right. Um, to be honest with you, I never looked at the warranty on my trailer. I knew that it had one. Uh, and I'm assuming when I drove it off the lot, that it pretty much covered everything, sort of like an automobile warranty would. Now, uh, one of the things that's come to mind uh, that someone mentioned is that if you take a cargo trailer and you start cutting holes in the walls and putting windows in it and whatnot, you voided your warranty. Yeah, I, I was talking to one manufacturer or dealer and that's what they said. Now, I don't know if that holds true for everyone. Again, if you are aware of that, um, let us know. Put that in the comments below. But maybe it's only the warranty on certain things, like not on the axle, but... Well, that's it. You know, I would think that you're not going to totally void a warranty on a trailer, a cargo trailer, because you put a window in it. That should not have an impact on whether the axle warranty is maintained and stays in effect. Painted and sealed to resist the elements. Right. Again, ours is not. Well, most most of these aluminum skins, that's a baked on enamel process or baked on paint. Um, and they last last quite well and I'm, I must admit my first trailer I had it for quite a few years and did hold up pretty good. Talked about the skin but the actual frame of the trailer right an aluminum frame isn't going to rust out but again you need to know as a buyer what you're getting if you buy a light gauge aluminum frame you know the floor frame of your trailer is aluminum but it's a light gauge and it's poorly welded it may not hold up as well or as long as a steel frame. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, you're gonna pay more money for the aluminum frame. So if you're like me and you're money conscious, you basically have to use your eyes to look at things and say, you know, this looks adequate, this looks shoddy, this looks adequate, this looks iffy. And then you make your decision as to which way to go. I want to address a couple of the things in here. So it talked about steel or aluminum, the thickness of the skin. Um, what about the tires, radial or bias ply? I don't know what that means. What's bias two? No, bias ply is the way that the plies are constructed. Okay. Um, they're at an angle in the over the tread portion of the tire. What's the normal? Well, the radial, radial the plies, the reinforcement in the plies kind of goes straight side to side. A radial tire flexes better. It gives you better gas mileage and generally better mileage on the life of the tire over a bias tire. Okay. So uh, we would prefer a radial tire. Then. You know, yeah, they used to make... What do we have? Are, these are radials that are on here now. Um, and most of my trailer tires have been radials. All right, V-nose or flat nose? Uh, again, the V-nose, when they talk about the length of the trailer, that V to the nose is usually in addition to whatever the length of the trailer is. So if it's 12 foot trailer, it's 12 foot plus the, the V on the front. A little extra space using the V-nose. So let's talk about um, the height. Well, what is the normal height in, in a cargo trailer? Is it six? I think six is the most common. Now, I did just see a, a dealer selling trailers the other day that had a five and a half foot interior height. Now, obviously, the shorter height, less wind resistance you're going to have. But if you're six foot four and you've got a five and a half foot trailer, I think you're going to be dissatisfied. So they do make them taller. You can buy them in usually six inch increments. I would love to have had a seven foot because number one, when you're doing wall cabinets in a house, seven feet is the top of the cabinets. That's pretty much the standard. 
So a seven foot trailer would give you the opportunity to put a kitchen or cabinet set up in the trailer and it would have the same kind of space that you're comfortable with and accustomed to in a home. What about a flat or a rounded roof? The only thing I could think, the benefit of a rounded, does the water run off it better? Yes. Okay. Screw or screwless? I have never owned a trailer that had the screwless panels. Obviously they're attached with some sort of an adhesive. Aesthetically, they're more pleasing to the eye, uh, probably in terms of keeping the finish on the exterior clean. If you don't have those fasteners to collect dirt around them, the, the trailer will probably stay cleaner longer. Don't know about the integrity of that adhesive that they're using to fasten it. One of the things with a screw, though, is once you screw that sheet metal to the stud, it's going to stay where you put it. Mm -hmm. That much I'm sure of. But I guess the worst possible scenario with a screwless finish is if it does start to detach from the studs, you can always go throw some screws in it. The barn door is my preference, particularly with the way that we have this trailer set up. If it's a toy hauler, you want a ramp door. But... All right, there's a couple other questions on here. Do I need to upgrade my driver's license? I'm assuming that's a no, at least in New Jersey. Um, check with your state. I did check into this years ago when I first moved to New Jersey because I bought this, my first trailer, and I had a, an extra long van. And there actually is something in the Motor Vehicle Code that talks about an articulated license. If you have a mm. vehicle trailer combination, I think in excess of like 35 feet. Uh, is that the registration? Because that's the next question. Do you well, need no, to upgrade is, the registration? This isn't the registration. We're talking about driver's license. The driver's now. license. Okay. But I think we get comments, oh my God, it looks so neat. And they know it's it's small and it's tiny and it's cute and it looks easy enough to do. And it can be. I mean, you can make it very simple and hardly do any construction in the build at all. And then you can go more elaborate with it and, you know, with all the bells and whistles. Um, but there are a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, you need a place to store this and you need something to pull it with. Okay. Now, we pulled this with, we call her Dora. The, it's a Ford Explorer. We went all the way to Florida. We, we prefer pulling her with the van and you don't even know she, the, the trailer is back there. So the size of your tow vehicle is definitely going to matter. You're not going to be pulling this with a little SUV or a car. Am I correct? Right. So, you know, unless you're willing and able to go buy a different vehicle, then I suggest that you do a little research and find out what your existing vehicle is capable of towing before you just go out and buy a trailer and find out that it's a little too much for your vehicle. I forgot, I didn't know I had these laying here. Okay, so just so in case people see them, these were my get lit fire starters. I did a video uh -huh. on these a couple weeks ago and I want you to think there's something else. Yeah, she used to roll doobies for <laughs> Chief and John for their movies years ago. Uh, so anyway, there's a video for that. I'll put, I'll put it up in the link. Because that liability insurance is uh, covered on the trailer by the vehicle that's towing it. The problem is that insurance is only extended to that trailer when it's connected to the towing vehicle. So if you're pulling a trailer and you get uh, a little bit of loss of control and you start swaying or something and your trailer sideswipes a car, then your tow vehicle's and liability insurance will cover that. If you got a trailer parked on your street, not connected to a vehicle, and all of a sudden a, mm. uh, a hurricane strength windstorm comes up and blows your trailer down the street and it hits two or three other cars, there's no insurance that covers that trailer under those circumstances. That's a good point. So, you know, I see it all the time. A lot of people will drop a cargo trailer or a camper trailer or a boat trailer out in the street just, you know, for a short period of time. But the reality of it is a lot of the law enforcement agencies will actually ticket you because it's illegal to park a uninsured vehicle on a street. And that's what your trailer is when it's not connected. When it's not connected. It's a good point. We're also going to be doing a video. We're researching it now about getting insurance for a converted camper. 
not always the easiest thing to do, but, but we will have some more information in another video about that. So anyway, hopefully we asked, we answered most of your questions about what to look for in the cargo camper. Um, look, you need to do what's right for you. Okay. For some people, a tent is all they need. Okay. We didn't mind tent camping. Uh, um, as long as I had an air mattress, I was fine with tent camping. You know, if, if you don't have the tow vehicle, you can do everything that we're doing with the tent. Uh, and there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's less expensive. So you need to really do what's right for you and what's practical for you. So hopefully this helped. If you have any questions, um, comment below. And That's a wrap, everyone. You know what to do if you like this video. You all come back now, you hear?